ourselves. So I think that we'll start, if I may, with Mr. Grubel and then Dominic and Riz Khan. So Oswald. We had uh, quite some, uh, quite a remarkable time in the last 15 years when globalization really started and uh, going so far as uh, some people probably today arguing the Communist Party of China is uh, a better capitalist than uh, anywhere else in the world. And um, that is what, what you hinted to, what we have to discuss. And, uh, Normally, power is going where the money is going, and um, we have uh, the West and the industrialized world in the last um, 10 years alone, I think. We have created hundreds of millions of jobs in uh, the developing nations uh, by outsourcing uh, cheap production and uh, paying with uh, money which we deliberately devaluated as well. So we thought uh, we might be on to good thing here. And also, we forced um, <clears throat> the developing countries who produced all this wonderful stuff and took our money for it to invest the profits in our treasury bonds so that we can go on spending. And that seems uh, to be, if you keep going on forever there, uh, a good business proposition. Um, now, <clears throat> did power actually and how far did, uh, could they uh, accumulate power in, in, in the last few years and will it last? Uh, can a country like China grow at 10% or 8% forever? As we know from experience, um, that at least is very difficult. So uh, We are already surprised uh, that it lasted as long as it did. The growth. What we also did, uh, we engineered a world financial crisis, and again, it was not only the banks, there were governments, and everybody was in there, uh, but the politicians cleverly blamed the banks for it. Now, what are we doing? And the solution we have for that is uh, suddenly we have to increase liquidity substantially at banks, and has already been. We most banks half their balance sheet. We will increase uh, capital, we we'll double capital at banks, and uh, under Basel III by 2019. So I would think in the next 10 years, at the end of the 10 years in uh, 2019, you will have overly liquid, overcapitalized banks, but till then, very little economic growth. On top of it, uh, you have uh, <coughs> through the transparency we created in government finances, especially in Europe, uh, astonishing revelations and um, which are not inflationary, they are deflationary, substantially deflationary. So we will see if uh, these emerging economies, how they behave and how much they can <coughs> actually uh, Yes, rely on their own uh, economy within the country and what they have established so far, how they will be faring there. So I would say at the moment the judgment is still out uh, of a power shift, and, uh, but the next 10 years will be very important. Thank you very much. The global financial crisis we're all suffering represents not just a problem, but an opportunity. That's set to be the message from the Prime Minister today. Gordon Brown's to claim the financial crisis has thrown up a unique opportunity to create a truly global society. He's championing internationalism, not protectionism, and he reckons the United States and Europe are going to be key to forging his vision of a new world order. And he's outlining five challenges facing the globe in a key speech at this evening's Lord Mayor's Banquet. They're the economy, of course, but also terrorism and extremism, climate change, conflict and ways to rebuild states after war. It might be the closest we get to an apology. Prime Minister Gordon Brown under fire to apologise for his role in causing the recession and lagging in opinion polls has said he wished he'd done more to impose better regulation earlier. He's told the Guardian newspaper he takes full responsibility for his role in the economic crisis. Perhaps 10 years ago, he pondered, after the Asian crisis, when other countries thought these problems would go away, we should have been tougher. It's as frank as the former Chancellor has been, 
and is being seen as a political fight back. First, the bankers were made to apologise. Then David Cameron said sorry for the cosy economic consensus with Mr Brown. And now even the current Chancellor Alistair Darling has pointedly said ministers need to show humility. Now Gordon Brown's trying to do just that, but it's a tough fight back ahead. One poll shows the Tories on 42% and Labour struggling with only 25%, only just ahead of the Liberal Democrats. And says Mr Brown he can't rule out a further economic stimulus package. What we have done in the last uh, few months is the biggest um, stimulus uh, to, uh, through fiscal policy to the economy that anybody has ever seen. But Britain, already spending proportionately more than any other country on its bailouts, may not want to spend much more, and Mr Brown may find it hard to do so and mount a fight back, even if he has said sorry nearly. We, we lived through an economic disaster, and now we're slowly recovering from it. We lost 20 percent of our national wealth in 18 months, the last 18 months of the Bush administration, and housing topped out three and a half years ago, not just in Florida, but around the country. And nobody has been held responsible, not Alan Greenspan, not anybody else. I think what confuses people at this point, Congressman, and having been talking about this incessantly for a few years now, most people, if you look at the polling, understand at least enough of this to know that Congress works for the banks, not for the American people. And yet Congress still seems phenomenally willing to drag its feet in addressing this. Uh, Harry Carey may be interesting or, or, or nice. We're probably not going to see it. We live in a democracy where we're told we elect people who look out for our interests. And yet the same people are creating laws that allow this group to con the American people out of the largest transfer of wealth in the history of the world with no consequences. Are you suggesting right. special interests have so much control that our government literally is willing to facilitate that level of wealth transfer with no consequences? I think that's a fair statement, and I would add to what was said before that we, we've got uh, the creation of the, the idea of too big to fail under Alan Greenspan. Uh, we've got him gunning the economy through the Y2K money supply increase that led to economic disaster within four months. He made mistake after mistake after mistake. And wh what we never hear from any of these people is, I'm sorry. We don't even hear that. What we and do I hear, think it's because the system is power. enslaved. Yes, that's right. And the Senate bill, unfortunately, does that. The Senate bill uh, takes wh whatever possibility there is of somebody who's actually looking out for the consumer and puts that in, of all places, the Federal Reserve as the one responsible to do that. The Federal yeah. Reserve, which is actually run by big banks, it's governed by big banks. They choose the people who occupy the seats of power in each regional bank. Yeah, and yet we're going to be giving yeah, them more go power. Ahead, Bill. Now to the economy and the news today that gave us the clearest, most vivid evidence yet of what a brutal decade this has been for middle class Americans who have found themselves losing ground economically. In fact, the middle class itself is shrinking. Our report tonight from NBC's John Yang. The American middle class, the historic backbone of the U.S. economy, is struggling through a lost decade, losing ground and shrinking in numbers. That's the conclusion of a new report from the Pew Research Center, which found that in the past 10 years, family incomes at all levels have declined. The first time that's happened since the end of World War II. There are fewer people in the middle now than there used to be, and they have a smaller share of a shrinking pie. Not only did incomes fall, but so did median wealth, what people own minus what they owe. It went from about $130,000 in 2001 to around $93,000 in 2010. Who do middle class Americans blame for this? In a survey, 62% said Congress, 54% faulted banks and financial institutions, 47% said big corporations. Only 8% blame the middle class itself. So they see this as a problem being imposed upon them by large institutions. Middle class Americans are also getting more pessimistic about the future. Only 43% say their children will have a better life than their own, down from 51% just four years ago. As people say they're working harder and harder just to stay even. John Yang, NBC News, Chicago. Near Lisbon, Portugal, a locksmith is cutting the bolts off an apartment that has been repossessed by the court, and he's putting new locks on the door. 
The family isn't home, and the place looks like they abandoned it. In Terrassa, Spain, outside of Barcelona, protesters try to stop the eviction of a family that's fallen behind on their mortgage. The father says, I want to work. I want to be able to pay a mortgage. What some call a recession is in Spain a full-blown depression that's hitting young people and young families the hardest. In Spain, the unemployment rate is 24.6 percent, close to the level in the United States during the Great Depression. But the unemployment rate for Spaniards under the age of 25 is an incredible 53 percent, the highest in Western Europe, higher than Greece, and still rising. It has created a lost generation of 20-somethings with very bleak prospects ahead of them. Spain is one of the EU countries being crushed by the euro. The one-size-fits-all nature of the currency is actually fighting against Spain's efforts to recover. On the outskirts of Barcelona, you can see one of the cemeteries for Spain's shattered real estate bubble. Buildings once under construction, now abandoned. Gravestones for a boom time that vanished. Youth unemployment is soaring. The number of people under 25 out of work is at the highest level since records began, with the rate in Spain and Greece at over 50%. A large proportion counted in the official figures are still in full-time education, so the numbers are inflated, but they're still alarming. Things are tough in the UK too, and now there are growing fears about a lost generation. Today's youth, because they're going to have a difficult start, are going to have much greater challenges of getting higher income, stable lives, family life than we had. And it's a real problem, not just for them, but for the rest of society. That's what this meeting was about, at least partly. Members of the European Parliament and national parliaments discussing the need to address the problem of what's being called the lost generation. No jobs, no hope. I think that this is one of the most uh, underestimated urgencies in the Europe, the youth unemployment and uh, the, the, the risks of exclusion. We could lose an entire generation in countries like Spain um, and in Greece. The cost, the economic cost of this, and the, the social cost is huge. Corruption by politics. The country's worst hit by Europe's debt crisis are also thought to be the most corrupt, according to a new global survey. Spain, Portugal, Italy and Greece all had the lowest scores in Transparency International's annual index. The report's director said people living in countries hit hardest economically perceive the problem of corruption to be worse. This proves what we have been saying for months that corruption in countries is closely linked to the economic and political stability of a country. Greece was considered the most corrupt among the EU's and Eurozone countries. Its global ranking fell 14 places from 80th in 2011 to 94 this year. Italy, Spain and Portugal, which are all mired in recession, also scored badly. The UK came 17th overall. Worldwide, Denmark, Finland and New Zealand were seen as the least corrupt nations, while Afghanistan, North Korea and Somalia were considered to be the most corrupt. The International Index measures the perception of corruption in the public and not the financial sector. Economists estimate a 1% decline in growth in developing countries pushes an additional 20 million people into poverty. And growth is expected to slow in developing countries at a greater rate than previously anticipated, from 6.4% to 4.5% because of financial turmoil worldwide. Already, the World Bank estimates, high food and fuel prices have driven 100 million people into poverty. The crisis is having a destructive effect on third world economies. The International Monetary Fund is warning that the economic downturn could create a widespread humanitarian crisis in the world's most vulnerable countries. The IMF has called on richer nations to raise $25 billion in the next 12 months. But if conditions get worse, the figure needed could rise to $140 billion. As the more developed nations tighten their purse strings, foreign investment is expected to fall by 20 percent. Money sent home by migrant workers is also likely to decline. There are concerns that social costs of failing economies could cause political unrest and even conflicts. It's estimated that if conditions continue, 
To get any worse, anything from 1.4 to 2.8 million children could die between now and 2015. The IMF's managing director, Dominic Strauss-Kahn, revealed the organization's predictions this week and urged the body to stick to its old commitments. He said, after hitting first the advanced economies and then the emerging economies, a third wave from the global financial crisis is now hitting the world's poorest and most vulnerable countries. I urge donors to rise to the challenge and provide the financing needed to preserve these hard-won gains that many low-income countries have made over the past decade and prevent a humanitarian crisis.